Have you ever had a fly buzzing around your ear and it's really annoying? You like try to shoo it away and it just goes to the other side and you try to shoo it away. It just keeps coming back and you think it's gone and it comes back again. That's kind of how I feel about the French defense. It's one of those openings. You don't see it very often, but when you do see it, it's kind of annoying. It's like, okay, what do I have to do with the French defense again? I don't really know what to play against this. And like, just stop playing the French. Like, just go away. Like, just, probably should go to counseling or something for my feelings about the French. But today, I'm very pleased to show you a game where White destroyed the French defense. And even Capablanca himself, the third world champion, got into trouble in the exact same way that we're going to see playing the French himself by not understanding some key features in the position, which we're going to talk about. Okay, so welcome to episode 10 in a series where we're going through this book, Logical Chess, Move by Move. We have an exciting game, so if you have your book, let's go ahead and jump right in. So E4, E6, this is the French defense. And one of the interesting things right away, he mentions that when you play e4, of course, you let out your bishop, you let out your queen. He also mentions that it gives the king some breathing room. Not that we really want to move here, but if we needed to, we could, right? And you think, well, it's so early in the game. Who cares? Why are we even worried about that? And he mentioned some really interesting games, which I'm going to show you very quickly. This one right here, it just looks like a normal game. And then all of a sudden, bam. There's checkmate on move six because black surrounded their king. The king didn't have breathing room and the game is over. This is called a smothered checkmate. All right. Actually, pretty common mistake. I mean, I say common. It's it's possible that a low rated player would fall for this. Right. Another way in the Karo Khan, it's a little bit harder to see. Goes like this. And knight to d6 is again checkmate because this guy is pinned by the queen. You can't take that knight. And again, we see the same thing where the king is surrounded. Okay, so I thought that was interesting. He pointed that out, and it's a valid point. You do have to be careful. There are situations where you can get just checkmated even as early as move six. All right, so let's keep going. D4, D5, this is what the French is, and we see the move knight to D2. Now, knight to D2 is obviously defending the pawn, but you say, well, why don't you go to C3 because isn't this the best square for the knight? And normally, yes, that is the case because you get more pressure on D5 or on D2, you, you don't. The problem is there's this line called the winnower variation in the French, bishop to B4. And that bishop is very annoying. It pins your knight. And again, you have to worry about the pressure on the light squares. And sometimes your pawn structure, for example, can get messed up and then black's going to start attacking you and all this stuff can happen. And when you play knight to D2... You say, no, I don't want to deal with that. No, no, thanks. I'm just going to defend my pawn. You can go there, and you're just going to totally waste your time. Thank you very much. Now you have to move, and I'm I'm really happy. Okay, so that's why you might play this. It's a trade-off, right, because you block the bishop, but then you don't have to deal with everything that I just mentioned. Okay, so knight to d2, and we see knight to f6. All right, so black is continuing to attack. And let me see what I want to say. Oh, so he mentioned something here. He says, Staunton explained that two pawns side by side are very, very powerful. And the longer you can keep them that way, the better. So why does white voluntarily kind of decide, let me go ahead and push forward. And it goes back to, there's pros and cons to everything, right? You lose the, the strength of the pawns being in a nice line. You do create a hole here on F5. So maybe one day a night, from black could land there. But what do you get in return? Well, you cramp down on black's position. So this bishop now is really stuck. You're forcing this knight out of its good square and you're just gaining a lot of space. So it's a trade-off. And white decides, you know what? I'm gonna give up my two pawns side by side so that I can get some extra space. And that, that's a fair trade-off, okay? So the knight goes back and let's keep going. Bishop to d3 develops the bishop to a nice diagonal. Nothing really crazy there. C5, this is super common in the French defense. If you're going to play the French, you kind of have to strike with C5 pretty early and start to attack on D4, okay? And so white defense makes a lot of sense. Knight C6 keeps attacking. And now we see an interesting move. And let me ask you guys, if you haven't read the book and you're playing in this position, what move would you play probably to defend this pawn, right? Black's attacking it two times. It's only defended one time. What would you play to defend the pawn? If you had a chance to look at that, uh, I'm going to say most people would probably say knight here, right? And that's not a bad move. Uh, it's I think I would be tempted to play that because I don't really play the French a lot and I don't really understand everything about it. 
But in this game, we see the move knight to e2. Now, why would white play knight to e2 instead of f3? You're supposed to put your knights on the best squares. What's going on? Well, it actually has to do with the, the basically black's plan is always going to be to keep piling on this d4 square. Okay, so they're not going to just stop with these two pieces. They're going to attack it again with the queen. And white wanted to be able to deal with that by playing the move knight to f3. So what they've done is they now have both knights defending d4. If we go back and you would have played this knight, well, then how are you going to respond to queen to b6? You can't play knight to b3 to defend because you walk into a fork. That's no good, right? So you have an issue of like, okay, how exactly do I defend my pawn? It's attacked three times. I only have it defended twice. It's not really easy to figure out what to do, okay? I think the best thing would be to like just castle and just maybe just sacrifice a pawn. But that's the reason behind what white was trying to do, leaving this square for the other knight, okay? So that's what we see, queen to b6 and knight to f3. And right here is kind of a critical moment in the game, okay? And this is where he mentions Capablanca. Now, Capablanca was the third world champion, extremely talented, strong chess player. But he was playing a game against Alakine, another world champion. I think Alakine was, was later. I think Capablanca and then I think Alakine eventually bumped him off, if I'm not mistaken. Could be wrong. I don't know, like, all my history. But Capablanca, very strong player. He's playing as black. Alakine was playing as white. And Capablanca also got this position wrong and didn't play it correctly. Okay, so here's the thing about the French defense. You're either going to attack on d4 or you're going to attack with f6. You, you have to do that at some point to gain some space, right? It's a very passive opening and you're supposed to strike back at some point, right? And if you don't do that, you're going to get into trouble. And that's what we see in this game. Black didn't understand that and ended up with too passive of a position. They simply played the move bishop to e7. And as the game goes on, we're going to see how they got into trouble. So what they should have done would have been something like this. Trade the pawns first and then play the move f6. And basically, if you don't do something about this, they're going to take you. Because now they have three pieces attacking this. It's only defended twice. You can't really add another defender without losing some more pawns over here. So you kind of have to take. But then when they recapture, they have more spaces for their pieces to go to. This bishop can come out. They could really castle either direction. It's much more... Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, there's more space. They've just freed up their position. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So you kind of had to do that. And what's interesting is that even Capablanca himself didn't do that and got into trouble. So just real quickly, I'll show you what Capablanca did. He did start, sorry, he did start by trading. Then he went with the check. And after King E1, he decided to just go back. And he was going to have to go back anyway. So he just kind of preliminary did it ahead of time because A3 was coming. And then he played the move, I think he played, uh, what did he play? Let me see. Oh, yeah, knight f8. He played knight f8 because he's trying to get his bishop out. And then after b4, he played bishop d7, bishop b3, and then knight to d8. Okay, so look look at his position. Now, he's a, he's a you know world champion. I can't say that I'm better than him. He understands what he's doing. He, was, he had a lot of ideas. The game went on. We're not going to look at it. But the point is his position was totally cramped, and he ended up losing. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that he just didn't have enough space to work with. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with playing a defensive passive opening, but you have to strike back at the right time or you're going to get into trouble. All right, that's kind of the key takeaway from, from this game. So going back to the game, Black did not do what they were supposed to do, trade here, play f6. Instead, they simply played bishop to e7. Okay, so let's keep going. Castles and castles. And he makes a note here that black is still playing mechanical chess. Basically, he's saying, look, all black is worried about is like, well, I'll just develop and castle. That's what I pretty much do every game. That's what I'll do here, develop and castle. The problem is he's not understanding that your position is so cramped, you need to strike back. That's a key feature, and he misses it, and now he doesn't have an opportunity. Okay, so he had the opportunity to play f6 for like two moves there, didn't play it, and now you get into big trouble. And here white has a very powerful move. Knight to f4. Now, why why is knight f4 such a powerful move? You should be able to figure this out based on what I just said. Why is knight f4 such a powerful move? All right, well, hopefully you said because it prevents f6. Because black still can free up their position if they're able to play f6 and just bust everything open and let all the pieces out. But if they play f6 now, what's the problem? The knight is going to grab on e6, threatening the rook, 
let's say the, the rook moves, now you can just jump back, you're threatening a fork here, and if they simply try to take you, you're also threatening a fork here, and black's position is kind of falling apart. Okay, as an example, if you go back, something like this, you could trade, and then probably, what's the best move, just d5, you have this protected pass pawn here, and again, it's just a really bad position for black. So that's the idea with knight to f4, okay? It stops this counterplay of f6, all right? So black, instead, plays knight to d8. Now, why do they play knight to d8? Well, they realized at this point, I should probably play f6, and I can't, so I'm going to defend that with knight to d8, okay? Let's the queen and the knight defend, so they're now threatening f6. So you kind of know what black is, is going to do. What do you think you should play here as white? If you had a chance to look at that, the move played was queen to c2. And the idea behind queen to c2 is not really to attack the pawn and take the pawn. Yes, it's a threat, but of course black's gonna see it and deal with it. So the real idea behind queen c2 is to force black to play a pawn move that creates weaknesses, right? And if you've been following the series, you knew that I was gonna say that, you knew that that's, that's what we were about to see. Okay, so black has to make a decision. Do you play h6, do you play g6, or do you play f5? These are kind of the three options that you usually have when you're trying to deal with a threat like this. And black decides to play f5. Now, very briefly, why did they decide not to play g6 or h6? Well, if you play g6, what do you guys think the major problem is with this move? If you had a chance to, to think about that, the major problem is you're not really gonna be able to play f6 and break things open like you were before. And the reason is, let's just say white plays bishop e3, black tries to play f6. There's a sacrifice now on g6. You bust open the king side, the queen comes in, and after check knight here, you have a threat on the rook and also a checkmate threat. And it's just, it's just a bad situation for black, okay? So because of that sacrifice on g6, you can't really play f6, and I don't know what black's gonna do. I mean, look at their pieces, they can hardly move, right? Every, everything is, is just stuck. Okay, so that's why g6 is no good. And then h6 is also no good because of knight to h5. So you take advantage of the fact that this square is open. And there's a very nasty checkmate thread here if black tries to again play f6. So if, see if you guys can see what's the thread here for white. If you have a chance to look at that, the move is bishop to h7 check. You can't run this way because you just walk into checkmate right away. So you have to go into the corner. But then it allows the queen to come in and whatever, there's a checkmate thread here, so you have to deal with that. So you have to play this. And then the bishop sacrifices. And when you take, there's checkmate here. So again, it was, white was just busting through, black was in trouble, and that was also not a good option. So because of that, black says, okay, well, let me play f5. And there's a key move here that white has that you have to, you have to make sure you don't miss this move. So what do you think white played here? Well, if you had a chance to look at that, the move is on passant. Okay, you have to on passant. Because if you don't on passant, then this is super annoying. It totally shuts down your bishop. It's it's like, how are you going to get through now, right? This pawn's going to be a, a very big problem for you. And so on passant is a super easy solution. You clear that. Now, that being said, black recaptures. And for a moment here, it actually looks okay for black. Because you've freed up your pieces a little bit. The bishop now can start to come out. The knight um, also defends, so you're dealing with that. You've opened up the f-file for your rook. This is defended nicely by two, three pieces. And you've eliminated that annoying pawn, which was kind of cramping the position. Looks pretty good. However, there's one problem, and how do you think white took advantage of the situation? All right, if you had a chance to look at that, it's knight to g5. And basically saying, look, the if you think about black's position, what are the weaknesses on the king side. What are the weaknesses? Well, remember, when pawns move forward, they create weaknesses. Which pawn is gone? The F pawn is gone, because it had to recapture here, essentially, or, you, you know, th these pawns essentially got traded. And that means the light squares are kind of weak. So what does white do? Well, they attack the light squares. Now, you're threatening to just take this. And black doesn't have an easy way to defend that. It's already defended twice, but now there's three attackers. So what are you gonna do? Well. You have to choose, and black decides to play g6, trying to block off the bishop. But if you would have played h6 instead, that's even worse. If you would like to pause, what's the conclusion here? 
All right, super nice finish. Bishop to h7 check. You don't want to take it because the queen comes in with checkmate. So you have to move your king. But then knight to g6. Beautiful checkmate. This guy's defended. This is controlled. And that's just a very nice way to end the game. So h6 doesn't work. So black says, okay, let me play g6. And now white also had a nice move. What did they play here? Had a chance to look at that. Of course, hopefully you saw this. Same idea. Sacrifice the bishop and jump in with the queen. By the way, whenever you're attacking somebody's king, if you have the option to sacrifice one of your knights or bishops for two pawns and get the queen in to launch a quick attack, it's usually worth it. Like, it's usually worth it, okay? Even if it doesn't lead to checkmate, just the fact that those pawns are permanently eliminated and the king is going to be exposed for the rest of the game, that's that's worth it. That's worth two pawns in, in most cases, okay? The only exception would be if... If black's queen was somewhere over here and they could very easily force a queen trade, then you might not want to do that. But as long as the queens are going to stay on the board for a little while and the king is exposed, it's totally worth it. Okay, so uh, that's what white does. Black plays king to h8. And if you would like to pause, how do you finish off the game from this position? Got a chance to look at that. It's actually mate in three and there's two different ways you could do it. Number one would be queen to h6 check forces this. Then you could jump in with this knight, and you're actually threatening checkmate here and here, and black can't stop both of them. So you could try to defend the bishop, then you could checkmate it right there, or you could play something like knight f7, trying to defend that, but then you get checkmated here. Okay, so it doesn't really matter. Game is over. And then also, you could have also won the game with knight to h5. You're threatening checkmate here. Um, if the rook tries to stop, check and checkmate is another way to do it. And if the knight takes your knight, then you have checkmate here. Okay, so multiple different ways. Lots of, of nice checkmates there. So basically, pretty quick game. I mean, it's like 18, 18 moves and, and black is checkmated. And it all went back to the fact that going way back, let's see, right here, they didn't understand the idea of the opening they were playing and it, that they needed to get more space. Okay, so the key takeaway, I think, for most people is like, make sure you understand the idea of the opening that you're playing is one thing. And then also, another key moment, I would say, was right here, when white played queen c2 with the idea of forcing a weakening move. Okay, force the weakening move, and then take advantage of the weaknesses that are created. And that's exactly what we saw after f5 on passant. The light squares are weak, so white continued to jump on them did it very quickly before black had time to get these other pieces mobilized and into the game. And then sacrificing at the right time led to the quick finish. Okay, so nice little game, a little bit shorter than some of the other ones, but hopefully you learned a lot from that. Let's jump in to the questions from the previous episode. All right, so first question from last time is from Mark Karras, And they ask, right in this position, if you remember from last time, White played d4, which was kind of adding an attacker here, and so black played queen c7 to defend. And then white was able to play h3, which dropped the pin, and the game went on. So the question was, instead of queen c7, why doesn't black just play bishop g4 right away? Because you are pinning the knight, which takes the pressure off e5, and you didn't give white time to stop you with h3. So you kind of get what you want, you just don't play queen c7. And that makes sense, however, there's a tactical idea of why that doesn't exactly work, and the idea... Or actually, if you want to pause, what do you think the idea is? There's a tactical reason that white can white can do something. It's, this is not a good move. All right, if you had a chance to look at that, the move is D takes E5. And the first point is that if they take you, you're going to throw in the queen trade, and then you're going to grab this because you've eliminated the pin by throwing in the queen trade. Okay, and you just get a free pawn. So the only thing black could do to prevent that would be to trade this guy first and force you to recapture and then take back. However, we now have another move, queen g3. And look at this, it's actually just a simple fork. And black has to choose which pawn they're gonna lose. So you could, you know, castle or something to defend this guy, but then I'm just gonna take on e5 and I win a pawn that way. Or you could play knight c6, defend this guy, but then I'm gonna take this. And you might say, well, what about rook g8? Don't I get into trouble here? And the answer is actually no because black's pieces are not set up in a way to take advantage of this. Yes, you have a rook there, but you don't have any other pieces that can come in. The knight can't really get over to the action. You just take it. This guy, I guess you could say, could go here, but that doesn't really do anything. You lose a piece. 
The only thing you could try would be like queen d7 trying to come over here, but white has time to deal with it. It's it's a slow, you know, slow plan and it gives white chances to do stuff. So really there wasn't anything there for black. So to answer the question, if you do bishop g4, you're going to lose a pawn. That's that's what it comes down to. You're going to lose a pawn. So that's why black played queen c7 instead and you don't have to worry about that. Okay, good question. That's the answer. And there was one more here that I wanted to answer from some false genius. And if I'm understanding the question correctly, it happens a little bit later in the game after the knight got to d5. It was right here when we traded the bishop. And I believe the question is basically saying if black would have had some more defenders on the dark squares, maybe the queen was in a better position to help or some other pieces were in a better position to help, would we still trade our, our knight for the bishop? And the answer is no, we would not, because this is a very powerful knight. Most of the time, I'm not not trading this knight for a bishop like this. It's a bad bishop. It's like stuck behind some pawns. It's not really doing a whole lot. It's cramping their position. My knight looks amazing. Normally, I would not trade that, okay? In this game, like we talked about last time, there was a very specific follow-up. He was going to trade. He was going to invade with the queen, and immediately start attacking stuff and immediately take advantage of these dark squares. Immediately. The very next thing that happened, boom, the dark squares are being taken advantage of, right? If you couldn't do that for whatever reason, like maybe the black queen was, you know, here helping to support the dark squares and you weren't going to be able to infiltrate or something, then no, I would not give up my knight for the bishop because that just doesn't make sense. Okay. So that you have to have a clear reason for making trades when you're attacking. It has to be a very clear reason. So I hope that makes sense. I think I'm understanding the question and that's what was being asked. So good questions, guys. Make sure, leave comments, leave questions. We talk about those in the next video and helps with the YouTube algorithm and all that good stuff. So yeah, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that and I'll see you next time. Stay sharp, play smart, take care.